pleasant and good morning. Topic today is one that I've been wanting to deal with for a very long time, but procrastinated to bring it to the forefront because I wanted to be absolutely sure of the conclusions and the biblical um, what should support. I say? Support, yes, thank you. Before touching such a delicate topic. On the surface, it wouldn't seem apparent, but this text is deep, is, is, is to me even deeper than the research that I've done in Revelation. So much so that no one study could really do it justice, but we will try to, to um, do as best we can today and see how far we reach. If we can't complete it today, then, then we'll just complete it another day. Because I don't want people's minds to get so saturated that by halfway through the study, you just can't take any more. It's a lot of text going to be coming to you, left, right, and center. I tried to take out as much as I could, but for this one, uh, I, I thought it best not to take out too much. So if you find that we have a lot of repeat information from the Bible, of course, then don't mind it. It's important that we, that we do that because at the end of the day, we're only interested in what the word has to say. Okay, so the topic, the second coming came, will be now, this will be now part four. The great and dreadful day of the Lord. A study of Second Peter chapter 3. We start off with Second Peter giving us a reminder in chapter 120 to 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men or man, but holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is a very pointed reminder that we need to keep in mind all the time. As far as I'm concerned, it's not only with regards to prophecy, it's regards to scripture. Scriptures and prophecy was never put there for us to interpret God's word. How could creation interpret what the creator wanted to say? Rather, we should let the Bible interpret itself. And we know how to do this. Here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. And more than anything, let's listen to what the people in the know, i.e. John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles, had to say about these scriptures that were written in old time. Note, Peter is not considering his letter a piece of scripture as we do today. And I have no qualms with anybody who says that the New Testament is the scriptures. But notice, the apostles didn't think so. They considered the scriptures, as Peter just said here, words written by men who were um, given this information by the Holy Ghost as he moved upon them, and it was written a long time ago. Men of old is what he's referring to. So at the time of Peter's writing, they were writing letters. We today have it in our, 
in a you know in a binder and call it the Bible and call it scriptures. And that's okay. But understand what I'm saying. So so to get the ball going, keep this in mind that we're not going to be looking at any opinions where this is where this is these important matters is concerned. It's too 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 um delicate for that. So the first question that we always want to 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 address so that we can put the thing in the context that we need it to be in, and then we could get an understanding thereafter is who was the original audience? Who was Peter writing to? Who was the letter mailed and addressed to? We start with First Peter chapter 1, verse 1. And by the way, group one, you all did a fantastic job with this question. Right? I'm just going to add to it. Because, of course, I had more time to, 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 to research it. So, First Peter 1, verse 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, that is, you may say, David, but that is First Peter. You're asking a question about Second Peter. I know, but hold on. The two letters were written to the same group of people as we will see shortly. So notice the, the place that he, he, he sent this letter to. It was addressed to Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Acts 2, 5, 8, and 9 says, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, if it didn't say Jews, one may have just thought, well, if it's the men from all over the world, then it's everybody. But Acts 2 5 is very clear that it is Jews. And the day in question is, is the day of Pentecost. This is where we are for context, okay? And then they said, in verse 8, and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. So obviously these Jews were not born in Judea. They were born in other nations that existed under the heaven. Medes, this is a, a short list of them. Partitions, Elamites, and dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, in Pontus, and Asia. Now, that's just a short list. I didn't continue with the list because the, what I wanted to do is compare the names that we see Peter is writing to in, in First and Second Peter with who he spoke to on the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost, they spoke in tongues, and everybody understood them in their own language. And thousands of these Jews were baptized. Look at where some of them were from. Pontius, you can see Pontius there, and scroll down, you see Pontius in Acts. You see Cappadocia in, 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 in First Peter, and we see Cappadocia in Acts. We see Asia in First Peter, and we see Asia in Acts. So clearly, Peter is not writing to strangers. And when I say strangers, of course, there will be many people he doesn't know by that time. But these are people who were in Jerusalem and heard Peter speak firsthand, face to face, as the Bible would put it. Now he's sending a letter to them at some point in time down the road. So clearly, Jews, and clearly, 
people who he is acquainted with. Now, it doesn't say Galatia and Bithyana in Acts 2, 5, 8, and 9, in that list of, of cities. However, let's take a quick look at a map of the, of the area. Remember some of the names? Let's see if I could get a pointer here. So there's Pontius. There is Britiana, another one called there's Galatia. Um, those three we show off. Then if we look in this area here, Asia, and we see Sicilia and so on and so on. Clearly, the area that he is writing to is a large, a large area consisting of, if you will, if you will many different states but is a big part of the same mainland, right? Asia is, is, is part of this um, territory, but it's much bigger than Asia. Galatia today is Tur Turkey, or called Asia Minor. But this gives us a visual of where this letter was directed to and where the men who were in Jerusalem at the time of the um, Pentecost, day of Pentecost, this is where they had come from. Note, it's a devout Jews, because not all Jews were devout, but these were devout in that they were keeping the law of Moses and coming to Jerusalem three times a year, as was required. Now, instead of them coming, letters are coming or sent to them. As we are on this, because I wouldn't come back to the screen, note that the seven churches or assemblies that God is determined to send letters to, the letters of Revelation to, are in the very same geographical region yes. as where Peter is writing to. So we have Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Ephesus, Smyrna, and Laodicea. All of these cities are in Asia. So can we say safely that when Peter wrote the letter and sent it to Asia, the same churches that got the letters from John the Revelator got Peter's letters? Yes, clearly. Very good. All right. So let's come off that visual. Now, the main reason for asking that question of whether it is addressed to Jews or Gentiles is to exclude us from the game. Too many times we put ourselves in the audience as if the letter is being written to us. And that's a habit we get from church. Therefore, if we look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, and put ourselves in the audience, then Peter could not be writing about the second coming. In order for that to be related to the second coming, we have to extract ourselves from the audience. So it's either he was writing to us or he was writing to them. And it is in that more direct manner is why I'm asking Jews or Gentiles. Following down, continuing down, so we saw a picture of the, of the churches. We just have a text here to support. So... Revelation 1 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, the very same place that Peter's letter went to. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Second Peter. 1-1. One, one. So not to be mistake, not to get confused, the first um, text that I read was from 1 Peter 1-1, one, one, and now we are in 2 Peter 1-1. One, one. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle 
of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter is saying to his audience, you all have obtained the same grace and precious faith that we have had through our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's how he starts the address of the second letter. He does not say to those in Asia and Pontus and so on and so on in the second letter. He just starts it raw like that. Fellow brethren, 1 Peter, back to 1 Peter 2.12 says though, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evil doers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So here we start to get down to it, the nitty gritties. When he wrote the first letter, which clearly was addressed to the Jews, he was telling them, please conduct yourselves in a manner that the Gentiles looking on on you all would see a certain characteristic reflective of the Holy Spirit so that our God will get good reviews based on your characteristic behavior. He's not speaking to Gentiles. He is speaking to Jews and telling them, make sure that what the Gentiles see in you is what should be seen. Why? So that we can all glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, I highlighted that, even though we're not, we are reached this part yet, because I want us to see that the urgency of Jesus' second coming was what the main thrust of all this writing was. This is the first um, letter, the first epistle. And he's talking about the day that Jesus is going to be visiting. 1 Peter 2, 25 says, for ye were a sheep. The Bible has, the King James has, going astray. I have changed that in my presentation here this morning. For ye, you, were sh a sheep that went astray. The difference is going is present, continuous, as opposed to past tense, that went. And of course, I'm going to use the scriptures to show why in context, this word that went is, is more, is, is the correct um, translation than going. So I'm going to read it and then we'll get to the nitty gritties. For ye were a sheep that went astray, but are now returned so you see that? It fixed itself. Going but returned cannot be in the same sentence. I don't know, but probably that's how they spoke in 1611 or 1613. But certainly today, that would not be a correct statement. If you are a sheep going astray, but you are now returned, you're going or you're coming? Decide. Um, and But you are now returned unto the shepherd and the King James again has bishop. If you click on that word in the Strong's, you will see that the root word is overseer. It did not have bishops in Peter's day. That is a Catholic word that came in from the Latin way down in the uh, 4th or 5th century. So obviously, bishop wouldn't have been the word in the Bible. I don't have a problem with it. I just like to make things clear when I'm reading for ultimate understanding of scriptures. Since we're dealing with who he is writing to and trying to place or immerse ourselves in that audience, 
then we need to use the terms that that audience would be familiar with, and they would not be familiar with Bishop. So, reading this whole text, just from start to finish now, very important text. For ye were as sheep that went astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now for the text that bolsters my reasoning for not using the word going astray. Matthew 10, 6 says, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We know that Jesus is speaking to his disciples and sending them on a mission. He isn't sending, he doesn't say do the, the sheep that are going astray. They are already lost, past tense. Those that have uh, are lost, go and find them. Go rather to the lost sheep of where? The house of Israel. No Gentiles in this house in sheep. There are no Gentiles in, in, this, in this text. Matthew 15, 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of of Israel. Again, first he sent them out. Now Jesus is saying, my, my, my um, mission, not your mission that I just read in Matthew 10, 6, but my mission is only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then Luke 15, 4 to 7, which I wouldn't read, is about the parable of the lost sheep. If, if somebody loses a sheep, he leave the rest in the pen and go look for that one sheep and rejoice, all these things are referring to Israel. So when Peter addresses this group and says, you are the sheep, he is not addressing Gentiles. Second Peter 3, 1 to 2. The second epistle, beloved, I now write to you in both which I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, the apostles of our Lord and Savior Jesus. This will be Paul himself, James, John, whoever. But who is he writing to? The Gentiles are nothing to bring back to their memory. They didn't used to go and sit down in the synagogue and listen to the, to the Torah and the Tanakh read on the Sabbath day. So what memory would he be bringing Gentiles to? He is speaking, again, to Jews and saying, I'm writing this now, to bring to your memory things that were written and things that we are familiar with. Very similar to the, the note that the person who wrote Hebrews took. Galatians 2.7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, that is Paul speaking here, as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter. Of course, I'm not bringing in the whole context and text for these texts because of time. But this text is, Paul speaking, is clearly denoting that Peter is not um, the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter's primary objective is to the Jews. And Paul's primary objective is to the Gentiles. Now, does that mean that they can't talk to other parties? That would be nonsense. We very well know that Peter was the first one to jump out and talk to the Gentiles. Paul wasn't even in the picture yet. Right? Um, and likewise, when Paul is writing, he addresses both Jews and Gentiles in his writings also. But it is what is their primary focus is highlighted in, in Galatians. Um, Paul is the, is the apostle to the Gentiles, and Peter clearly 
is the apostle to the Jews. I'm going to continue reading, even though I'm not connected as yet. The next text is 1 Peter 5.13. And this text is to, to, so firstly, before I read that text, are we in agreement that, or can we, can we uh, agree based on the scriptures that this was written, this letter, both letters actually, one and two, was written primarily to the Jews, which were scattered into all these other lands. That's the first thing that we need to agree or disagree on. Agreed. All right, one Agreed. agree. Agree. The, the second part of that question to group one was, where was it written from? I didn't hear an answer. I don't know if you all had enough time to discuss it, but the answer is found in 1 Peter 5, 13, which is the end of the first letter. And it says, the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluted you, and so that my son, Marcus. Now, we know that Peter had children. I don't know if Marcus was his flesh and blood kid, or if it was like, you know, how Paul calls Timothy and Titus and they his sons. But the where it is written from is Babylon. Now, was there a church in Babylon? And when I say Babylon, i.e. the Babylon in, you know, where Nebuchadnezzar the, uh, uh, resided in that area. Oh. No. No, not at all. Babylon. There wasn't even a Babylon. Babylon had been destroyed many hundreds of years prior to this statement. So then, where was Peter? Revelation 14.8, correct, says, and the, 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 the proof for that is, Revelation 14.8 says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That great city, note it. Now we read Revelation chapter 11, 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. So Revelation makes it very clear and distinct, using figurative terms to refer to Jerusalem, but in all the terms that it uses, it connects them by saying this is the great city. So Babylon is the great city, Egypt, Sodom, great city, and the giveaway, the absolute giveaway, is where our Lord was crucified. Now, it would make sense that Peter is in Jerusalem. We saw that at the dispersion of all the disciples and, and, and believers from Jerusalem when the persecution started, who did the Bible say stayed and remained in Jerusalem? Peter and the apostles. They did not leave. That doesn't mean they didn't travel out and into Jerusalem back and forth, but their focus was the capital. Peter was the head of this assembly. Jesus gave him that position. And obviously, the head of the thing must stay in the capital. Because if people like Paul, notice when people like Paul had to go to find Peter, if he was all over the place, you come to Jerusalem, remember these men walk in, they ain't like traveling on an aircraft or some kind of thing. You walk hundreds of miles, how much weeks to reach Jerusalem, and when you reach Peter, Peter not there. No. Every time you see Paul or anybody went to Jerusalem, Peter was right there. Because that was his headquarters. And so I'm saying all that to, to just, you know, to, to, to finalize the, 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 the understanding that when Peter said, 
we who are here in the assembly in Babylon greet you. Peter was actually making us to know that he read Revelation. And when I say us to know, it's because he was talking to them. The book of Revelation was already printed. And when I say printed, the, the, you know, the scrolls was already written at this point in time. Because you can search your Old Testament from cover Genesis to Malachi, and you will not find Jerusalem referred to as Babylon. Now, she is called Sodom in the Old Testament, which we just read in Revelation, but not Babylon. That term for Jerusalem is only found in Revelation. Right, that's another highlight point there. Okay, so just so that we'll have this, this text that we um, looked at on screen in the video, because I'm sure that this video is one that people want to go back and pause and start and pause and start. Um, here are the texts, Galatians 2.7, um, 1 Peter 5.13, Revelation 14.8, and Revelation 11.8 8 is where we stopped in terms of not seeing text. So we're back on screen. Here we go. <clears throat> Ezekiel 37, 16 to 17, 22, 24, 26, and 28. Now, for time's sake, I wouldn't read the, write you. What, what this, this is a, is a prophecy that Ezekiel got. Remember, Ezekiel is the prophet that is residing in Babylon. He was a, uh, take away. He was, he was, you know, one of the people that they um, kidnapped, well, not kidnapped, but when they conquered Jerusalem, he was in one of the first waves to go down there. And God is still talking through his prophets, even if they are in Babylon. And this is one of the prophecies that he, he got. And this prophecy is referring to not just Jerusalem and Judah, which was the only um, part of Israel that existed at the time of Nebuchadnezzar, because the other 10 tribes had been scattered long before by uh, Sennacherib and, and the other um, various nations. They had been scattered abroad. Now, here's what God comes and tells his beloved prophet. Verse 22, um, I'll start from 17. And join them one to another. So he's, 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 he's shown some sticks. And he's told to take these two sticks and hold it in his hand. Just to get us going. Right. And join them one to another into one stick that they shall become one in thy hand. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king of them all. And they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they, shall, they all shall have one shepherd they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Now, I, I of course, for time's sake, I kind of cut and paste the verses. Please feel free to go read the whole chapter. But the scenario, the synopsis of this is that at the point in time, nobody had even, well, I shouldn't say nobody, because it still had King Zedekiah. When he got this vision, Zedekiah was still in, 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 um, in the throne. But the two nations had been split 
from way back with Jeroboam, when Solomon's son became king, and he play he want to be like Colum in birth and raise taxes every day. The people said, we will have none of that. And God split the nation into two. So Jeroboam took the 10 tribes and went that were to the north. And Rehoboam, with his greedy self, remained with just Benjamin and Judah. And of course, the capital city of Jerusalem. Samaria became the capital for the 10 northern tribes. As fate would have it, they became evil, king after king after king, more and more evil, as we all know, Ahab, Jezebel, all of them, the whole bundle of them, until God was had enough of them and let the nations around them from the north and from over the river Euphrates, etc., come and disperse the entire 10 tribes of Israel. There was nothing left of them in the land. They were slaves and and all over the place, in Asia and Cappadocia and these places. Here now is Jerusalem stone and Judah. They are now in captivity in Babylon. And God comes with this message of solace to Ezekiel to tell him that the day is coming when not only would Jerusalem go back, because that was prophesied by Jeremiah, that after 70 years they will return, but also everybody from the 10 tribes and the two tribes will be reunited as one tribe. And again, we see this word used, sheep under one shepherd, have nothing to do with Gentiles when we refer to this particular part of the topic. Now we will get to us just now, just be patient. So, the 12 tribes will now be formed as one. Notice who is their king, David. David is long dead. David was after Saul, the first king. He is dead and gone. So if David is the one who in this prophecy is said is going to be king over them, we all know that that is Jesus, right? The seed of David. Jesus. When did Jesus become the king of all the sheep of Israel and, and, and build his sanctuary in them? This is a ticklish one because here it is today, church upon church, religion upon religion are binding together and calling themselves lovers of Zion and Zionists and all sorts of things and sending wads of money to Israel because they're all looking forward to the rebuilding of the third temple because of prophecies such as this. There's another, you know, there's a very long three or four chapters prophecy about a temple in Ezekiel, but this also. So the whole world is, I, I was just hearing just this morning that even in Japan, so it's not just English, English places doing this. The churches in Japan, Christian churches in Japan, are all praying for Israel and sending money there. And they are flying the Israeli flag in their churches. Just this morning, I got that information. This is a big thing now. This is rebuilding this temple. They're just hoping that somehow the dome and the rock would be miraculously bummed up. Or earthquake will just match something, and they'll be able to rebuild this third temple. That is a topic for another day. I actually have a topic coming up with that with the temple, so we don't want to get too deep into it. But what I do want to 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 highlight here is that Jesus wasn't coming here to build no physical temple. This sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore, of course, is the cornerstone Jesus who came and laid the spiritual temple. No more of brick and stone and mortar. Each person coming into the kingdom of God, Peter refers to them as lively stones being built in to the sanctuary. There's one sanctuary, one shepherd, one king. 
and that is Jesus. And there will not be a third century built in physical earthly Jerusalem. Jesus will be in the midst of them forevermore because what does he say about us? Know ye not that ye are the sanctuary of, of God and his Holy Spirit dwelleth in you? He's dwelling in our sanctuaries to this day. Now we notice I included us in the thing there because we come into us now, right? We were told in Luke, I didn't put the text down apparently, but many sheep have I which are not of this fold. The fold that Jesus came to deal with was the sheep, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Notice he didn't say Israel and Judah, because at the time when Jesus came to this world, there was no Israel and Judah. It was the two sticks, just as prophesied, joined back together, one nation, Israel. Jesus came to them, the lost sheep of Israel. But he did say, thank you, Jesus, many sheep have I which are not of this fold, not of Israel. And that's where we come in, guys. So welcome to the club. We are also sheep of the pasture, which came from the other folds. And that is Gentiles of whatever nation. It doesn't mean Tutmun Bagai. Wherever you come from, once you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, these are sheep from the other folds. And notice it's not a few, it's many. Okay, so... This is how we're going to take our feature text, 2 Peter 3, 10. Second. Yeah, David, just the text that you want, that you didn't put in, John chapter 10, verse 16. Thanks. You could read it first? Yeah. John chapter 10, verse 16 says, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Amen. Right? So, then we go to the 34. All right. 2 Peter 3.10 is our feature text for today. Even though it's the whole chapter we deal with, it's the feature text. And what you'll notice is that I've done is, is color-coded it. It's the first time I've done this, and I don't know how it will work, but I'm hoping it will work out. What I've done is color-coded it because each color represents a phrase that we would break down individually. So the whole text says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night and blah, blah, blah. We will deal with the day of the Lord first. Then we will deal will come with the thief in the night, then we, in which the heavens and earth shall, heaven shall pass away with a great noise. Then, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, then the earth also, and the works therein shall be burnt up. And in the PDF notes, it's also color-coded. So hopefully when you guys are reviewing, if you so choose to do, it will be simpler. And I did it for myself too, because I'm telling you, this, is, this to me was more difficult than any chapter in Revelation to decode, honestly speaking. Peter had to throw a wrench in there for us. <clears throat> but we'll take our time with it. I'm not, I'm really not worried about time. If we do finish, we'll just continue it on next side. I'm more important, more concerned that we get it because this is like a very critical topic. The amazing thing is that we look at the whole scriptures and we see that Jesus said, all, when he said in Luke, all that was written of me was fulfilled. When he died on the cross, he said, all that was written of me was fulfilled. All the scriptures, and he took them through from, from Genesis to, 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 in their case, Chronicles, which is the law, the prophets, and the Psalms and said, everything that was written of me was fulfilled. He did not say, a lot of people make this mistake, he did not say that all the scriptures was fulfilled. He said, all that was written about me was fulfilled. 
in a later um, text, it says, all scriptures must be fulfilled in this generation, all that is written. So if all the scriptures had to be fulfilled in that generation, then how comes Christians today still going through the Bible, looking for what is for us? No, guys, there's nothing for us. It was all fulfilled, and there's no such nonsense as it was fulfilled and had to be fulfilled again. That just doesn't make any sense. So, what we have is like I was thinking about it this week. You know, when you buy one of those books which have numbers and like animals and places and buildings and so on, and you, you connect the dots from one to, I forget, it, I think the name of the book is Connect the Dots, I'm not sure, but those with infants might correct me, right? And you go one, two, three, four, five, six, and you trace out until you form the whole picture. And then you turn the page and you do it again and again and again, different pictures. What we have in, of the Bible is somebody else bought the book, done trace out everything, and there's nothing left for us, no new pictures for us to connect no dots. All we could do is look at the dots and apply the pictures to ourselves. But we're not getting the opportunity to trace nothing new because there is nothing new to be traced. So all the scriptures had to have been fulfilled. And therefore, it made me wonder, and this is a wonder from not now, for years now I wonder in this, 10 or years. It's not like every day I'm thinking about it. But every time I come across this text, I just procrastinated to deal with it. Because this is the one text that stood out like, how comes everybody else um, wrote about the second coming? Everything in the Bible is fulfilled at the second coming which was AD 70 thereabouts. And Peter just sticks out this in front of us as to the end, 2,000 years down the road, which is our time now. That didn't make sense, but I couldn't make sense of it, so I left it alone. But I always knew it had to be addressed sooner or later. So having said that, this is how we're going to get into it, and hopefully it will make sense at the end of the day, because nothing that those boys wrote about was concerning 2,000 years down the road. Peter was writing to the Jews, to people, who, the believers then and then, with a hope for something that was imminent. However, the language of this text sends our imaginations into overdrive as you heard you know just examples of it with with sam and, and and ian that some of that is from church some of that is from hollywood but as you will see today it doesn't align with scriptures